Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. What works in endpoint security? Surviving advanced targeted attacks by augmenting or replacing legacy AV with NSILO. Sponsored by NSILO. My name is Carol Aw of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speakers are John Pescatori, Director of Emerging Technologies at SANS, and Justin, who participated in this What Works paper. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to John. Okay, thanks, Carol, and welcome, everyone. I'm John Pescatori. I joined SANS about, let's see, it's about six years ago now, after almost 14 years before that as the, the lead security analyst at Gartner. And today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on two areas that uh, I've really spent a lot of time looking at over the past 20 years. Uh, one is finding success stories in uh, finding security managers and security people that took some chances and did real actions to improve security at their company. And that's what uh, what works is all about. We'll drill down, down on that in a bit. And the second is improving security at the endpoint. Um, after all these years of Windows PCs being the target and many, many upgrades in the Windows operating system, uh, we still see a lot of very static, very reactive security strategies, unfortunately, on endpoints. And since that's the thing closest to our employees, our users, and often our customers, um, it's, it's been sad how little progress we've made there. So I love highlighting success stories in that area in particular. So let me give you an idea of what we're going to do in today's web, webinar. Um, we're going to focus on a what work study we did, and I'll drill down on that in a bit. But it's part of a larger thing to do at SANS, trying to celebrate su success stories of in cybersecurity. You know, it's sort of like airplanes. You, you very rarely see a headline uh, about the airline captain that landed the plane safely, unless it's something like Captain Sully landing in the, in the river. Uh, but you hear breathless coverage of every crash. In cybersecurity, there's no shortage of publicity around the breaches. Uh, what's missing is is the ability to share success stories about the security managers who managed to avoid the breaches or at least avoid damage to the business due to advanced attacks. And uh, we focus on celebrating those successes in three different ways. There's a program I call uh, Difference Makers that we run. We solicit nominations from the SANS community of people who've made a meaningful difference in security, the people who typically don't uh, get a lot of publicity. And in fact, uh, the public uh, solicitation for nominations for that just went out today. I'll give you a URL later on in the at, at the end uh, that you can nominate people at your company or your customers or whatever you've seen. There's another thing we do, uh, the SANS Best of Products, where we ask the SANS community uh, specifically what products do they think really helped them in the past year. And then finally, uh, the what works program which is where vendors provide uh, me access to some users of their products who've had success stories who've made measurable differences in the security at their companies and uh, i interview them and we do sort of a transcript of that interview and it turns into a what works paper that you'll all get sent then we essentially recreate the interview in a webinar and that's what we'll do today now, historically, when I worked at Gardner all those years, one of my favorite uh, research notes to write were case studies that were very much like what works. One of the biggest barriers to seeing more what works in case studies is companies are hesitant to expose themselves about successful things they've done in security, fearing it'll make their company more of a target. So just like I did with case studies uh, at Gartner, we do the same thing at What Works. We offer the opportunity for the company to stay anonymous and also the user to have some level of anonymity. So we'll just, uh, our security manager, our user here today, Justin, we'll just use his first name and uh, we won't uh, go specific on, on what company he's with, but uh, we will definitely drill down in all the other areas be, besides 
besides uh, the identity. So I'll do a little bit of an overview here, lay the groundwork for this particular area, then we'll kick off uh, the conversation with Justin. And we'll save plenty of time at the end for questions, but as Carol mentioned, um, there's a question toolbar on the right, or a question widget on the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll be trying to watch that window as we go along. So if you have questions as we go, um, ask them right away and might be able to get to them uh, as we're in the flow of the conversation. If you are watching a recorded version of this webinar, at the end, we'll give you an email address where you can uh, put your questions in and we'll get you answers after the uh, live webinar here. Okay, so with that, let's get started. So, you know, I for many years, I've used a very simplified equation for talking about cyber risk. And it's a little different than the traditional probability of occurrence of the bad thing times the, the potential impact of the bad thing, which usually results in an imaginary small number getting multiplied by an imaginary big number and ending up with an imaginary medium-sized number. Um, so the equation I like to use, you see it there in red, is, you know, in order for there to be a risk, there needs to be a threat. That's the easy part. The threat actors are out there. They're, they're finding ways to attack us and they're thinking about attacking us. The second thing there needs to be is a vulnerability. And since uh, we use a lot of software and a lot of people, we know there's always going to be vulnerabilities uh, in both the way our people use software or fall for attacks, the way IT operations fails to patch things or configures things wrong, or just the fact that every piece of software is constantly uh, requiring patches and new vulnerabilities are found. Uh, we don't control the threats. Um, we don't really control the vulnerabilities in software and, and even in people. We can do some things to, to reduce them. And that's where the action component comes in. So really, without action, th uh, the risk is uh, just sort of a theoretical thing. Once the bad guys take action on the plus side, that dramatically increases the risk. You know, if you think about the terrorist attacks of 2001, the riskiest time was on September 10th. Uh, we felt much more risk at risk at September 12th after things happened. The highest risk was right when the actions were starting. But we also play a role in this, and we can uh, add action to the mix to decrease the risk. Uh, and that action can be by Avoiding vulnerabilities, switching away from vulnerable products or, or turning uh, ways on that make it much harder for vulnerabilities to reach the user or, or be or for the user to be impacted by vulnerabilities or for attacks to reach the vulnerabilities. Um, and that's really key. That action component is the differentiator um, from the security teams that are in the news for breaches and the ones that largely either are not in the news or have minimized the damage to the business by preventing more or by detecting attacks faster, being able to respond more quickly and minimize or eliminate the damage. So that's sort of the, you know, the high level and it's the action part that's key and that's what we celebrate in the What Works program is action. I can't help but in this area point back to a Gartner research note I sort of forced uh, uh, the analysts who covered antiviral at the time to write with me back in August of 2001, so over 17 years ago, which was saying signature-based AV at the desktop is dying. And that was driven by, any of you who are old enough to remember 2001, the uh, code red and NIMDA worms at the time that were exploiting Windows vulnerabilities. And, and uh, there were more that followed in 2003, but in 2001, it was code red and NIMDA. And people just relying on the standard desktop defenses got decimated. It was mostly denial of service impact uh, back in those days versus breaches, but it was the same thing. And over that intervening years after that, we started to see many of the antiviral desktop vendors um, talk about changing things. But here we are 17 years later, uh, the growth of Windows endpoints has largely flattened as most of the growth is more in tablets and smartphones and the like. But when you look at like the Verizon data breach investigation report or other after action reports, so common it's Windows endpoints were the source of the initial uh, compromise or, or uh, penetration that led to the breach or denial of service tech or whatever. Um, and over those years, uh, the standard antiviral vendors have added many components to their suites that were theoretically behavioral based or many other things that would uh, not not be 100% reliant on signature. But uh, the antiviral market is, is uh, I hate to use that term in public, but it succumbed years ago to what I call signature crack. It's a great business model. The Wall Street analysts will say, uh, we're downgrading the antiviral sector because there have been no attacks, no successful attacks this uh, past quarter. 
which means their products are succeeding and they got downgraded. But whenever there are successful attacks, which happen almost every month, if not every day, the Wall Street analysts will say, we're raising our estimate for the antiviral vendors because of all these successful attacks. It's kind of odd. It's saying their product did not work, so we're raising, they're going to make more money. And that's a hard business model to shake. Now, signature-based detection of malware and removal of malware definitely has a place in the mixture, but it can't be the majority of the funding we do. It can't be our, our, our only or our major strategy for protecting the endpoints. We've proven over those 17 years that it, it can't be that because it can't work just doing that. So it's well overdue for revolution in the way we change endpoint security. And that's what we're trying to get at uh, over, over all these years. And these recent attacks uh, from a couple of years ago, WannaCry, Petya, not Petya, you know, they really pointed it out. Um, they mostly were going after well-known vulnerabilities, but um, since there hadn't been attacks against those vulnerabilities before them, there were no signatures out there. If you're ever tuned in on uh, cable TV or satellite TV to one of these like National Geographic or some outdoor specials and you see a bunch of penguins huddled on an iceberg and then you see some sea lions leap up and eat some of the penguins on the outside of the circle. Um, to me, that's sort of the antiviral model. You know, the penguins are huddling up so that not all the penguins will get eaten, only the ones on the outer side of the circle. And in antiviral, you know, the uh, few, few companies have to endure big breaches and then signatures come out for those attacks. And then later 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 attacks are stopped and, and save the middle penguins. But modern attacks evolve so quickly that that strategy you know, really hasn't worked in years. A big impediment, many people feel, to making real progress and, and sort of adding to what they do on the endpoint or totally swapping out uh, the security stack on the endpoint. It's been this fear of the huge cost of change, getting a new uh, security agent onto the standard gold image, or, well, we're so used to the management console and so on. And uh, Peter Forsberg at Gardner did a great note years ago looking at the real cost of changing. And it was you know under $4 a desktop at, at the time. And it's probably actually less today when you think about it. But when even if you take the high end of that cost, um, the cost of improving security at your endpoint is much less than one major breach, let alone constantly repaving 15 to 25% of your endpoints every time something gets compromised. Or when we start looking at ransomware attacks, um, some of the numbers that came out certainly with the uh, FedEx and Mercs, the FedEx unit and Mercs in uh, uh, Europe that had incidents, you know, just an eight hour outage, let alone a two, two week outage. Um, so, the costs of changing are, are definitely lower than even one medium-sized breach in, in, this, in this area. And one of the success strategies many have been able to do, if uh, you don't have sort of cooperative management or uh, sort of a path to making this change without sort of sneaking it in, is if you're transitioning, whether it's the Windows 10 on the desktop or putting in, you know, moving from Office to Office 365, cloud-based email, or any any major IT changes, it's a great time to say, okay, we're going to work in changing that security stack, either augmenting it or swapping it out for approaches that do more active um, protection and and uh, can help avoid damage. So after all, what we're trying to do in security is uh, reach that point where we're moving more quickly and focusing on minimizing the damage to the business. So this area has grown to be called by analyst companies, uh, mostly Gardner defining this one, endpoint detection and response. And you see the, the, the definition up on your screens there. IDC has a slightly different term, endpoint specialized threat analysis and protection. And I think Forrester's calls everything zero trust, zero trust these days. But essentially, you see the, the latest definition there. It's to more quickly detect that something, I'll give you my version, more quickly detect that something bad is happening on an endpoint and minimize damage. It may still be we're reacting by limiting damage, quarantining things, sandboxing things, stopping, whatever it is. It doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% preventing a bad executable from ever getting on an endpoint, but from the perspective of the business, the business can continue. Uh, and that's what's really important in the way we should be measured. So what we're really trying to say in many ways is, you know, incident response indicates late action. And we have to work on our incident response processes and make sure they're up to date and rapid and accurate and so on. But the further to the left, we can move up the kill chain. We can move from sort of cleaning up messes to minimizing the side of messes, damage minimization. And then the biggest bang for the buck comes into the things we can do before the attack even starts 
to avoid as much damage as possible and, and put mitigation in place, whether it's shielding things or, 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 or detecting so quickly that we can limit the damage, limit the spread, limit the activity malware can do. That, that's where we start to see real change. And, and those are the actions that are needed to demonstrate to the business that all this money they're spending on security is actually making a difference to the business. Uh, and obviously it has to do that in a way that's not uh, shackling the user and interfering with uh, what the users do need to do. So with that as sort of a quick uh, flyby intro, let me uh, uh, ask uh, Justin to open up his microphone and uh, we'll interview uh, Justin here for his experience and what he got done. Justin, are you there? Hi there. Okay, good. Let's uh, let's start out. Can you give us a little idea of? I, I, obviously, we'll keep things anonymous, but little idea of your background, your role at the company you're with, and uh, and the environment you're, of your company. Yes, um, my name is Justin. I'm IT security manager working for the company, which which wish is not to name here. Um, it's not part of our culture to talk about the name of the company and the technical references, or we also want to stay anonymous, um, not through security, through obscurity, but just for the culture of the company. I'm within the company for, or for more than five years. Um, I'm mainly responsible for the whole incident management um, as well as all infrastructure pro um, projects which have a regard to security. This also brought me to Ensilo um, a couple of years ago where we tested it. Um, also to my background, I'm a lecturer at the University of Applied Science. Um, with this uh, in the area of security management. Okay, can you give us an idea of sort of the scale? Uh, you know, is it a global company? Uh, roughly, how many endpoints? You know, some idea of the scale you have, you have to deal with. Yes, um, our company is set up globally. We are in more than 150 different countries. Um, we have 176 offices spread all, all over the world. We have approximately five or 15,000 endpoints spread all over the world. The most of them are mobile devices, some kind of laptops, MacBooks, um, partly Windows, partly uh, Apple devices all over the world. Okay, and uh, you said you're the, the uh, cybersecurity manager. Roughly, how how big is the cybersecurity team? Our team is approximately ten internal persons and a bunch of external consultants supporting us. Okay, so now we have an idea of the scope. Um, obviously, since we're talking about Ensilo's uh, endpoint security platform here, you're you're focused on trying to improve security on the endpoint. What sort of problems are you dealing with that um, started you in looking at things like this? Uh, in the beginning, I think as the most uh, or the most problem we had in the IT where we we have been fighting with ransomware, where of I think almost any kind of ransomware in our department. We just did firefighting. So we saw the outbreak of ransomware in a certain office or in a certain area and started to get rid of it. As soon as we get rid of it, we find, it, find another one. So this brought us, hey, we need a solution for ransomware. And I guess it was four years ago. Um, there was no real solution on the market, which it was known for solving ransomware. So we did a lot of hardening stuff. And in parallel, we tried to search for solutions which were capable of doing it. And this in the end brought us to Ensilo. Okay, and I assume uh, you said you had a mix of Windows PCs and Apple devices. I assume you were running like standard uh, desktop antiviral platforms on all of them? Yes, yes. But as you said in the introduction, I think the standard signature-based antivirus solution are going to die. So we also get rid of certain platforms from the classical antivirus solution. We just had one of the attendees send me a question saying he remembers that 2001 research note in CodeRed and Nimda. So that was good to hear. Okay. Um, so 
you, you had the problem. Uh, can you walk us through how you looked at candidate solutions and evaluated them and so on? We did some kind of cross check through the market. Um, one info beforehand, the evaluation of, a ven of the vendor took us over one year. So we tested almost every solution. Um, there were some new products, for example, Palo Alto Traps, which just came up with the idea of giving us protection and we tested one after the other. And not only is it just stopping the ransomware also what's the impact for the user is it has it some kind of seamless integration in the operating systems is it lightweight how many or what was the performance impact on the client itself do we get some problems with the classical antivirus solution do they fight against each other and so on and we started with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with eight different vendors. Um, came to the, or after more than a half a year, we ha had just three left. And out of the three, we just went with Silo. Okay, and uh, just out of my curiosity, the, so the proof of concept testing you did, you, you put them on, you set up like a lab environment and, and had them open to live. How did you end up uh, doing that proof of concept? Um, in the beginning, we started very, very, very small with just some test machines, see what, what the impact is. Um, in the final round with the three last vendors, we did very, very heavy pen testing. We had a lot of pen testers on site, tested against the application. We tested all the ransomware samples we have seen in the past or just coming up uh, also we did some kind of rollout in or in the IT department over 30 different countries to catch and to see as much as possible during this testing period and also what's the impact on our local applications I just have to say not every country has the same setup um, like the other countries also we do not have some let's say real golden image we have some base image which is the same for everybody but every organization or every country has some kind of adjustments for its own operating system because you the countries itself know best which applications they have to work with and it's absolutely fine to work with these applications which is also or made it also always also harder for applications for an application selection for us. Okay, so uh, you started with eight, narrowed it down to three, ended up choosing in silo. What were the major factors that you did you liked about in silo or caused you to go in that direction? Yes, I have the presentation in front of me, <laughs> which we have done for our CIO. Um, it was a, a, at first a good detection and prevention. We just found one sample which we're able to bypass and silo and we reported it is it's fixed and it injects al almost every process and it doesn't kill the process if something is happening so for example if you have some um, macro based malware and you're killing the process word everything is gone and Silo did it a, a little bit different. So it just prevents, for example, the network traffic. So the user is still able to work. So it's, there's no direct impact for the, for the user itself, which is absolutely perfect for us and for our environment. So we just get the notification in the central management console, which is, was also very important for us. And almost no impact for the user. We can set, we can do a, a higher security level for the user inform him, but he can finish his work, he can save everything and bring the machine back to the IT department. These were the most important points for us. Yeah. So let me understand how it works. Um, it does, the Insilo product does some detection and there's some automatic actions it takes or it's issuing alerts through the management console and you decide um, if there's actions to take or how does that work? Um, and Silo 
from my point of view, is a completely different approach to other comparable systems. And Silo has an as it's in post-infection um, prevention. This also takes me a couple of months to really understand what post-infection prevention means. Um, I don't want to have an infection, right? So, but and and Silo is stopping the consequence, which is absolutely fine. Um, so we really see real events. We don't deal with thresholds, with statistic values like this executable is 35 or is 60 or 80. You never know what's the threshold for bad. So in Ensilo, you see the complete kill chain. You see where it starts and where it ends and the consequence will be stopped. So if a user is clicking on a malicious link, in an email is downloading an executable um, which calls some C uh, command and control server. You can see the complete chain and you see that the, co uh, the connection to the command and control server has been stopped and no consequence happened. So this is what's the best thing for us. We really see what happened, what does the user has done and what would have been happened if we haven't had in silo. Okay, so that that type of automated action, even if it's you know it's not prevention, but it's stopping the consequences, not preventing the executor from getting on, but stopping the consequences, that puts a pretty high uh, premium on uh, minimizing false positives. So you mentioned on the false negative side, you saw one ex one issue that got through, you reported it in silo, fix it. How about false positives? Where we issues with stopping legit actions of legitimate executables? Um, we've seen certain false positives, but just if the programmers have done some kind of quick and dirty programming, so if it doesn't buffer overflow because it's programmed like it is, then it's or and silo catches it because it's not done like it should be, but it's not the fault of Ensilo. So this is the only thing I've seen false positives. And also once we had some issues with our business planning tool, but just in the reason of the policy set, which has been changed um, to a full blocking mode, then we get an issue, but this was our fault. More or less, we, don't, we do not really have to deal with false positives. Okay, um, so you went through the evaluation, silo on the competition. Once you made the decision decision to go with them, how did you go about rolling it out across the company and, and how long did that take? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was planned for, as far as I know, a half a year to roll it out. We started with small chunks, so country by country. And on every rollout, we started with some kind of monitoring mode. So application in silo has been rolled out on, let's say 100 devices. They have been running in, in some monitoring mode for two weeks to see, okay, what will be the, or would there be an impact on the devices? No, after the two weeks, we put them in the, we call it medium blocking group. It's some kind of um, policy set, which fits best for us and start with the next chunk or with the next country for the rollout. And it runs very, very smooth. So we decided to shorten it by half. And I, as far as I remember, we rolled it out globally in three months, also with the complete monitoring and testing beforehand, which is super, super fast for us because we are very, very, user focus and we try not to disturb or impact the user in a certain any way. So on your rollout, were you simply adding in silo to the desktops that had standard antiviral running? Were you replacing antiviral with in silo or how did that work? In the beginning, we had both in parallel, classical antivirus plus plus in silo. Um, one year ago, we removed the classical antivirus solution from all the Mac devices, and we are also planned to remove it from the 
Windows devices just go with a built-in antivirus solution plus in silo on Microsoft devices. Okay, uh, you said you have about 15,000 endpoints. One of the big issues uh, often keeps people with larger vendors is the scalability and the management console and all that. How have you found the, the uh, Ensilo management tools for dealing with all those endpoints? That's absolutely easy and from my point of view. So I'm not a deep technical guy, but I can understand it. And just the events show up, or I see an inventory of, um, of all the machines. And I just see real events in the console, which makes it really, really easy to go through it. So I see the event and the device where it's happening. I see the user which is impacted and I have the complete chain what's happening. So it's perfect for working. Also, I don't need the highly skilled persons to analyze these events. Okay, and I guess architecturally, there's uh, endpoint software that goes on each endpoint, and then are there management servers or, or reporting servers you had to sprinkle around the, the globe, or what's the architecture? Um, it's in cloud, or we have it uh, cloud-based. So we just have the client part installed, and all, or and the management part is in the cloud managed by Ensilo. We just have the web or we just access it via the web interface. Okay, so there's no uh, no managed servers or software running on servers. It's the software nope. as a service kind of approach. Yes, yes. Okay, um, so now you have Ensilo alerts coming out. Um, how, how is this administered or managed? Is there... That's simply somebody else who is in charge of des endpoint or desktop security. They're they're looking at the in silo information, or how how do you manage it? Mm -hmm. um, our partner who is managing our uh, our laptops, our devices, is also handling the in silo events as the first level because they know our environment. They can judge. Okay, is this a bad programmed application or is it a real event? So that they can sort it out, which is perfect for us. And if they have cases which they can't solve, they send it directly to Ensilo for a deeper investigation or for more investi uh, for, for more information. And out of this, they, they decide to send it to the SOC, to the Security Operations Center. Um, well, the next steps will be defined. Could be a re-image, could be a password reset or whatever, or have a deeper analysis. This is how we handle it. Okay, and uh, does uh, using it require tuning of uh, policies or parameters or, you know, one issue quite often with anything other than signature based is, does it take a lot of tuning? What's your experience with that within Silo? Yeah, it, initially it took, let's say, one week of tuning after collecting some data from our environment. But since that's that, we have never be or have never adjusted the policy set. It stays like we have started in the beginning, and we are running absolutely perfect with it. Okay, uh, let's see. We had a question come in. I'll ask now. Are you using it for uh, any like? Unix, Linux servers, or running on VMware, or anything on the server side, or is it all desktop? We do have some Windows servers, um, which are virtualized, which are running in silo. There, there are no problems, but we don't have so much experience running them on the servers. But it's our plan for the next months to roll to also roll it out for all the server environments because from my or on, on certain server systems in my from my point of view it makes more sense compared to a classical antivirus solution for linux we don't have any experience sorry just mac os x okay another question um are you integrating any alerts or output from in silo to a sim product a sim console at all yes yes okay so uh, do you 
with the way you monitor things, are you sort of really using the SIM and, or is there also a direct use of the Ensilo console for monitoring? Um, if we want just one, or the first levels are just using the Ensilo console, also Ensilo directly is doing the analysis with the console. Um, if we do further analysis, we use both as the console and the SIM system, but the events were mainly generated from the console from Ensilo. Okay, uh, so let's see, how long have you been operational using Ensilo now? I think it's three years now. Okay, um, is there something uh, recent 2018 or recent some event uh, you could sort of walk us through uh, how that how you handled that and how uh, you know you used in silo to minimize damage from that uh, sorry can you repeat the question I don't get it yes yeah, there's some uh, something something uh, some uh, either a malware event or a vulnerability event in the past uh, okay. year you know that you can mm -hmm. use as an illustration to help people understand how uh, how it helped you deal with that Okay, uh, two things. Uh, since we have Ensilo, we never had ransomware or we never had a single file encrypted by ransomware. We see people clicking on the same malicious links, executing malware, but it's not really coming to the client. There's, there is no impact. On the other hand, what I find, found very, very interesting is how much malware can bypass the classical antivirus system. So there, I don't know the numbers by heart, but there is every month more than hundreds or more than hundreds of malware which overcome a classical signature-based antivirus system. And the story which I like most, so we are talking about a post-infection prevention system. So there has been Spectre and Meltdown which was very known, although especially in, 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 I can speak for our region, and there hasn't been a patch and patching the BIOS uh, all on all devices all over the world would take us a couple of months. So I'd, we just shoot an email to Ensilo, ask them, what do you think about this vulnerability? Can Ensilo help us at this point? Is there some let's say prevention from their side. And the simple answer has been, we don't prevent you from grabbing the information from the CPU, but we prevent anybody from sending the information. So feel, sick, feel safe because there will be no consequence if there would be some piece of code which uh, uses this vulnerability, which brought us to our CIO who asked, what do you think about the vulnerability? And we explained it. We explained it to him, yeah, we can't, we cannot fix it now with the vulnerability, but there is no danger for us because there won't be any consequence, which is absolutely fine for us. And this brought us a, a lot of good reputation over the last months because every big event which was in the media was for us something we can say, yeah, we are fine, so no issues from our side, which is the best thing as a security department, you can say, I guess. Now, I mentioned in my intro, a lot of security managers find it uh, difficult to convince IT or the CIO or management to sort of change things on the endpoint. How did you attack that? How did you manage to get uh, buy-in to do that? True. Um, for us, it was also a hard story nobody wants to have anything installed on the client i think everybody knows how an and how heavy and classical antivirus solution is on the client also regarding the startup performance but we did so much testing also regarding what's the start startup time is there an impact on the applications um if you open them and we show them hey there is no impact or almost no impact 
on the devices on the or for the users and also we are in the good position that our cio trusts us and if we came and say hey this is the solution we have to go for and he said okay are you sure yes then go for it so which is good enough for for us and for the security Okay, that's a common thread. We here at SANS did a series on CISOs briefing the boards, board of directors and CEOs and what the boards were looking for and CEOs were looking for. And it was that ability to trust the CISO and be able to take their recommendations and help them move forward. So that's uh, that's very key. Okay, um, anytime we choose a new vendor or you know smaller vendor, support's really important. Been going for almost three years now. How do you rate the support from Insilo? If I compare it with other vendors, I would give them an 11 from from 1 to 10 because it's it's almost amazing. I don't know when the guys are sleeping. So every time you shoot them an email, you will get an answer within the next 50 minutes. And it's crazy. So, But I've never had a company where we had such a good support, honestly. Okay. Um, since you have been operational for a couple of years now, um, any lessons learned you can pass on to our audience? Anything, knowing what you know now, you would have done differently when you started? Uh, yeah. So, and Silo has some capability. It's called um, communication control. And the communication control is some kind of extra feature. You can deny network traffic for certain applications or for certain vendors never click or never deny network traffic for all unknown vendors it will definitely have productivity impact i did it once for a very very short time frame <laughs> and you can hear the scream or the people screaming on the floor okay let's say a question came in uh, asking about using uh the cloud-based capabilities was that something uh, you've been doing before using software as a service type capabilities did you have to do sort of a pilot to decide if that was going to work be reliable enough no we have um, a cloud strategy we try to have as much in the cloud as possible okay as you look uh, since we're here in the third quarter of this year uh, as you look forward to things you're going to do are there any uh, features or capabilities you've, you're you looking to come from in silo that you've asked them to add or you're hoping to see come? There are a lot, of, especially in the direction of EDR coming. Um, what I am most curious on is having it on, installed on our servers, which is a, a huge benefit for us, I guess. And uh, I think when you answered the server question, you do have Linux or Unix servers, but until yes. they have an agent, you won't put it on, or you're strictly Windows servers? Both. Both. My goal is to have it on, on, on both systems. So it will take us some time to be there, but it's. I think it makes more sense if you're thinking about a database server, for example, where a classical antivirus system is installed, what should it detect? So there's almost no real file. And we also find, fight a lot with fileless malware. So for certain server systems, it makes more sense to have some more intelligence software like Ensilo installed, installed on. Okay, uh, one question, since you are global and since often on these uh, earlier webinars, we have a lot of attendees from Europe, um, sometimes some worries about uh, so security software products on the endpoint doing some level of monitoring and be being considered violating uh, uh, privacy guidelines or now GDPR type things. Any Have you run into any issues there? Uh, we had uh, our colleagues from the legal department who went through it and checked whether it's compliant. And it's just collecting the events where something happening. So if I'm clicking on a bad malware link or I'm downloading malware, executing something, this will be recorded. If I surf the web open, I don't know, crazy applications which don't have and security impacts won't be recorded. 
So they just stick to the real events. So there is no impact regarding GDPR. Okay, I had a question come in. Uh, you mentioned earlier you have a, roughly 10 people on your security team. Are they centrally located or since you're in so many countries, are they scattered about? Uh, the most of them are um, in Europe, the rest in the, are in the US. So it's just for the follow the sun. We do have certain in the US. Okay, um, I think we've sort of walked through our, my, my standard list of questions. Final one I'll throw out to you. Is uh, anything I didn't ask you or anything else you'd like to say that we didn't touch on here? Uh, I don't want to do advertising for Insilo, but I, I'm really into the product and it helped us so much. And it also helped us so much regarding reputation reg uh, our, reg uh, regarding our senior management, because the most question questions that I've uh, said uh, beforehand we can answer yes, we are safe. So, which is incredible for our re reputation. Um, it took me, I guess, three months to understand whether the Silo approach is really helping us. Does it solve our issues? Because you, you infect the client, you just stop the consequence. Is it really enough or are there some use cases where it is not working so but after i went all went through it in my head i said yeah okay it's absolutely fine for us and it is the best solution otherwise you just get an an statistical value like 75 and i don't like thresholds yeah this is what i just wanted to add in the in the end okay well, another question come in uh, i think this is a good one if there were do you have any clients or if there are clients that don't have full-time internet connections, um, is there a problem in that you need to get updates to them? Does the product require updates? And if there's partially or not internet connected endpoints, is that a problem? Uh, not really, or <laughs> let's say partly. Yes, it is cloud-based and it's internet facing but it's also protecting if it's not connected to the internet so it's not necessary to have this connection it's important for us to get the events so we just want to see certain events in in the console yes there will be updates also regarding the policy or the or let's say from the detection mechanism to the software itself so yeah it would make sense to give them internet access if it's needed, but it's not necessary to have it all the time. And honestly, we do not have cases where we do not, or where we have clients which never have a connection to the internet. Okay. Uh, with that, we're pretty much at the end of our questions and nearing the end of our time. If you're watching a recorded version of this, you can send your questions to q at sans.org and we'll get your answers later on. Um, let me leave everybody with a list of some resources. There's the URL at the top for all the SANS what Works uh, papers, and this one will be published there as well. I mentioned the Difference Makers Awards. If you do subscribe to the SANS News Bytes list, you'll see we put an announcement in there and other social media reach out. But if you go to that URL, you'll find the instructions for um, how to nominate somebody and where to send it and so on. Um, there's Ensilo's URL for more information from them about their products. There's that q at sans.org and my uh, Twitter address. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Justin and then turn it over to Carol for any final words. All right. Thank you so much, John and Justin, for your great presentation and to Ensilo for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.